without any further ado, I will turn it over, introduce my esteemed colleague, Jen Gardy, um, who is wearing six hats, four, four hats, six hats here at the, at the Gates Foundation, uh, in addition to deputy director on malaria, heading up surveillance data and epidemiology, is also on the Institute for Disease Modeling leadership team, is a key role in terms of cross uh, foundation team modeling efforts, uh, genetic epidemiology, communication, uh, and, AI, and task AI task force, that's six. <laughs> kind of a senior program officer for some of the modeling stuff. Yeah, 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 too. okay, so seven. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, really delighted by uh, this uh, next panel. So Jen, over to you, and Thanks, welcome Philip. everybody. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, there is no other organization in the world I would happily wear this many hats for. It is a true pleasure and privilege being part of the foundation and the Institute for Disease Modeling. Uh, as Philip mentioned, I'm Jen Gardy, uh, deputy director and other hat wearer. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am so thrilled to be welcoming you to this morning panel. Before we get started, though, I did want to note that we are gathered today, at least those of us who are here in this room, on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people and the type of storytelling, learning, and conversation and connection that's going to be happening over the next few days has been happening on these lands for thousands of years. And so we respectfully follow in the tradition of the Duwamish people uh, in the work that we are doing over the next few days. So uh, panel today is going to be amazing. We have three incredible speakers who are going to be talking you through some of the social, political, ethical, and environmental dimensions of AI. And it's really interesting to see, you know, as Philip alluded to in his opening remarks, just how fast this field has advanced. If you rewind 20 plus years ago, my own PhD work was actually in the machine learning uh, space. I worked on machine learning based methods for biological sequence data classification back uh, long before support vector machines were cool. Um, and I certainly did not appreciate at the time, two decades ago, um, nor really up until maybe about six months ago, just how big a role ML methods would play um, in our, our society. Even if you ask me just last year, um, in my capacity as somebody that works with malaria data, with geospatial and math modeling, I still wouldn't have foreseen just how suddenly and how pervasively AI really became part of our collective consciousness and our collective dialogue. Now, as someone um, whose own research practice, you know, I work in a very quantitative space, but um, in the public health environment. Um, so my own work has always been very user centered, very people focused. And so one of my big concerns is I was starting to see AI really become so um, pervasive and, uh, you know, the, the cart um, Put it, being put before the horse, I was really worried a lot about some of the ethical implications and the responsible use of these technologies. Um, so one of the first things I started asking myself which the Gates Foundation itself is asking itself, is how do we approach these new tools through the lens of equity, through the lens of inclusion, and through the lens of safety? So I'm really, really, really excited for our panel this morning because we have pulled in three of the most incredible scholars who are working in this space. Um, they are going to help talk us through some of those questions. You'll have an opportunity to ask them questions and meet with them uh, later in the day as well. It's going to be a really enlightening and a really important session. Um, this is going to be an interactive panel. You're going to have the chance to ask questions of the speakers later, but there's also some interactivity built in. Um, we love a good menti poll here at the foundation. So for those of you who might not have used menti before, um, grab your tiny device, which I know you all have because we can't live without them, um, and go to menti.com. That's M E N ti.com. And when you go to menti.com, you'll see a little box that will ask you to enter in a code. The code, it's very small on the screen. I'll read it out. It's uh, 2961. 
5956. And so that should take you to an interactive poll where you have the chance to share what you think of AI. Are you terrified? Are we on the prep precipice of a Skynet Terminator moment? Are you, are you reluctant? You're like, this could be amazing, but there's a lot of potential harm. Are you neither here nor there? taking kind of the wait and see approach. Cautiously optimistic. I see we have a lot of cautious optimists. Uh, we have a few folks who are all in um, and probably more than a few of you who are just really sick of the hype uh, and, and having everything be AI this, AI that. I love this. Uh, so we'll do a couple more interactive exercises with Menti later in the morning. Um, but now that we've kind of taken the uh, temperature of the room, I want to go ahead and introduce my panel. I think one of the tenets of responsible use of AI is transparency. Um, so I'm going to be totally transparent with you all and say that I selfishly designed this panel to include three of my favorite people in the universe. Um, and I would invite them all to join me on stage now. We have Jared Thorpe, uh, Kate Crawford, and Nathaniel Redmond. Um, Jared Thorpe, he's this one in the blue. Um, Jared has been a dear friend friend of mine for well over half our lives. Um, he is an artist, he's a teacher, and he's an incredibly gifted writer uh, whose book, Living in Data, which I will hold up here. Da, 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 da. Um, this is Living in Data, A Citizen's Guide to a Better Information Future, and it paints really, really evocative pictures of how we as the public really need to stop being passive participants in the data extraction economy. We need to not just be points in a training data set, and instead we really need to become active citizens who are in charge of ours and our society's collective data destiny. Um, Jer has an incredible CV amongst many things. He was the uh, New York Times R&D Lab's first ever data artist in residence, um, and and one, he's got so many achievements that I could be up here for hours listing them. Many of them are described here in the book. Um, but one of the most beautiful ones that I think really captures the way Jer works is um, he was part of the team that created the algorithm that placed the names of uh, people killed in the 9-11 attacks on the new memorial at the World Trade Center um, because it's a beautiful example of bringing a human touch and a human lens to an algorithm and creating something really profound. So Jer's work is really all about centering humans uh, in our practice. Through Jer, uh, uh, I have had the incredible pleasure of getting to know our other two panelists today, both of whom are absolute rock stars. Um, believe me when I say we are super, super lucky to have them both here on the stage today. Kate Crawford, uh, down at the end, who's my outfit twin for the day. Um, Kate is really the world's leading scholar when it comes to the social implications of artificial intelligence. I cannot mention all her university faculty appointments, because again, I would be here for hours and hours and hours. Too many to name for one intro. Um, but she she is also a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New York. She has published in everything from Nature to the New York Times. And like uh, Jer, she is both an incredible artist and a very gifted author. Uh, her book, which I will also hold up, Price is Right Style. Da, 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 da. Um, this book, Atlas of AI, I think is just required reading for any of us who are working in this space. One of the reviews of Atlas of AI described it as eloquent and revelatory, which are two adjectives I would totally use to describe Kate herself. Um, she is currently leading the Knowing Machines Project, which is a big international research collaboration uh, investigating the foundations of machine learning. Uh, and Kate is also the only person that I am friends with who has ever been to the Oscars. Uh, <laughs> ask her about that later. It's a great networking question. <laughs> and then over here, wearing the most Pacific Northwest appropriate outfit of anybody in the room is Nathaniel Raymond. He is the executive director of the Humanitarian Research Lab at the Yale School of Public Health. And he is somebody that I first learned about and became a huge fan of um, because of a simple word, and that word is no. Um, let me tell you about that. So Nathaniel's work focuses on the role of technology and data in humanitarian crises. And I think you describe yourself as a fundamentally a human rights investigator. Uh, Nathaniel spent the earliest part of his career 
were um, out in the field. He was working with Oxfam and uh, Physicians for Human Rights. And in 2010, um, here's where the no story starts. Um, he was tapped by George Clooney, that Hollywood George Clooney, to work on a project using satellite imagery to address mass atrocities that were happening in South Sudan. And very quickly, um, and this is a story that JR relates in Living in Data, um, it became apparent to Nathaniel and his team that the work that they were doing, which is ostensibly to protect the most vulnerable citizens, could actually be bringing very, very real harm to the communities that they were looking to serve. And so after realizing the role that their projects, satellite imagery, data use, and reporting um, was you know, playing into the enemy's hands, potentially, Nathaniel said no. He recognized the responsible thing to do, and here's a quote from the book, when you don't know if you can do no harm, the responsible thing to do is to let go. Um, and I was instantly converted by that. Um, since then, Nathaniel has really been the world's go-to expert when it comes to data and technology in the humanitarian sector. Uh, he's led teams at Harvard and now at Yale, and he honestly is one of the most interesting people in the universe. These <laughs> three are truly some of the world's brightest minds when it comes to the responsible use of data, tech, and AI. We're so lucky to have them here. How this is going to work is I'm going to invite them each up to um, share uh, a little bit about you know things that they're passionate about. They're going to give you mini talks. Um, Kate is going to be up first. Uh, she'll be followed by Jer and then followed by Nathaniel. So they'll each give their presentations. I'll sit down there and watch like a total fangirl. Um, and then they'll uh, be here to answer some questions. I've got a few of my own. We'll use Menti to solicit questions from the audience, and we'll take it from there. Um, so I will turn it over to Kate for our first presentation. Thank you all so much for being here. Good morning, everyone. It is such an honor to be here with you. And I want to give a particular shout out to Jen Gardy for making this happen and bringing together old friends and new. So we're meeting today at the threshold of an inflection point in the history of artificial intelligence. Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, they're all putting generative AI across their entire product suites. ChatGPT has become the fastest growing consumer application in history. And now billions of people are changing the way they write, search, or create. And that's all just happened in the last few months. We feeling like it's a pretty rapid rate of change? Yes, yes, lots of nodding. <laughs> So who in this room has experimented with GPT? Great. Now keep your hand up if you've used it at work for the work that you do. Great. OK, so almost one for one. That's a lot of us. So you'll know that if you want to use GPT for something fun um, and playful, you can do things like get it to write a limerick. For example, about Elon Musk. This is what it gave me. There once was an, um, a man named Elon Musk who bought Twitter. What a big plus. Then came the tweets that caused lots of heat. And now he's known for his outbursts. Hmm. Mm. Doesn't quite rhyme, <laughs> but if you think about this as an ungrounded model where its knowledge graph ended in 2021, this is not bad. So this idea that we can type anything into a text box and get back an answer is extremely seductive. It's our own magical oracle. It's infinitely patient, infinitely knowledgeable. So people are using this for everything from writing news articles to devising company strategies to contesting lawsuits. But there's a problem here. And the clue, as always, is in the fine print. GPT may produce inaccurate information. So when it comes to large language models, we all know that they're prone to making up facts, what's known as hallucinations. Not only can they be wrong, but chatbots will be confidently wrong. They will cite you lots of sources that will make you be completely convinced that what they're saying is accurate. I've been calling this phenomenon halu citations, <laughs> literally dreaming up entirely fake sources for claims. Now that's fine if we're being experimental and we're being playful. But at work, this can actively lead people astray. And it's already causing a host of problems across multiple industries. I'm going to give you a recent personal example I had when a senior journalist reached out to me who was doing a profile on the podcaster Lex Friedman. 
she had asked GPT, who is the person who's writing the most? Who's the expert on Lex's work who I should be citing? GPT confidently said it's Kate Crawford and also the journalist Karen Howe. It then cited an article that I'd written about Lex with its citational information and then summarized it. Only problem, none of this is true. Have never written a word about Lex Friedman. Don't actually listen to his podcast that much. Not really a very good source for her. But we can't blame her for being taken in by this because it can seem so magically accurate with all of the hallmarks of reliable citation. So this phenomenon of being taken in by the AI magic show has been noted for decades. One of the founding figures of AI, Joseph Weizenbaum, actually created the first chatbot called Eliza. This was back in 1964 at MIT. Eliza was a very simple pattern matching program, basically designed to be like a Rogerian psychotherapist. She would essentially just repeat back whatever information you gave her, but in the form of a question. And people loved it. But to Weizenbaum's horror, people actually believed that Eliza could understand them and was deeply making diagnostic information available to them. He wrote in his book, short exposures to a relatively simple computer program can induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. Yes, that was 1978 <laughs> when he wrote this. And I think we can all understand why. A machine that literally seems to be conversing with us on any topic is naturally going to lead us to believe that it is somehow a reasoning entity. Now, the historian of science, Alex Campolo, and I have researched this phenomenon, which we call enchanted determinism. The belief that AI systems are somehow magical, enchanted, yet also capable of giving us fact-based, unbiased determinations. So when AI feels like magic, it can prevent us from asking harder questions. For example, what is the source for this answer? Who is responsible if this system makes a recommendation that ends up being harmful? How can organizations use these tools responsibly while also being aware of the risks? Because these are the questions we most need to be asking right now. So I'll give you some context. Um, in my book, Atlas of AI, I wanted to demystify artificial intelligence to understand how these systems are actually made in the fullest sense. And what that meant is I did a series of field trips around the world over five years, visiting everything from rare earth mines to factories to some of the largest data centers in the world. And in doing this, from understanding how data is collected, from looking at how human labor is used all through the supply chain, and what environmental impacts these systems have, it in some ways allowed the scales to fall from my eyes. It meant that I could see past the magic show and start to make different decisions about how and when these tools are going to be useful to us. Here are some quick examples. On the climate side, we already know that generative AI is five times more energy intensive than traditional AI methods such as search. We also know, thanks to a brand new study, that every conversational exchange with GPT, so every time you ask it anything at all, that is the equivalent of dumping a large bottle of fresh water on the ground, because that's how much water these gigantic compute systems take to cool, the equivalent of a nuclear reactor. And as we know with the SDGs, energy and water, this is actually taking us in the wrong direction. Second, there's the labor side. Click workers in Africa and Southeast Asia are being used to manually remove biased or dehumanizing content from generative AI, and it produces a lot of it. In the AI field, we call this RLHF, reinforcement learning, with human feedback. It's the unseen human labor layer that makes all of this magic seem automated. In the case of OpenAI, that work was being done by Kenyan workers who were being paid less than $2 an hour to remove toxic results. And a gigantic investigation revealed that many of these workers were suffering from trauma and extreme stress. Finally, there's the data layer. The training data that makes generative AI models is often 
gathered by doing an indiscriminate harvest of the entire internet. These data sets are huge, and understanding what's in them is actually a key part of actually being able to understand what they do and why they're producing hallucinations. Because training data is where AI builds its worldview. So studying these issues is something that we do in detail at our Knowing Machines research group. Uh, now, Knowing Machines is this international collaboration which looks at technical methods, social impacts, and legal implications. And I'm lucky enough to work with an extraordinary team, including Jer, who you'll be hearing from next, and also Sasha Lucione, who will be speaking with you this afternoon. And for example, what we do is we also build technical tools to look at data sets. Um, in my previous work, I've trained neural nets, uh, things like ImageNet Roulette, to actually look inside some of the biggest training sets for AI. Um, we're about to release this one. You're getting a very early preview. It's called CSET, and it basically acts like a gigantic search engine. So you can also start to look into these training sets and see what's inside them. And they are massive. This is a um, lion face, which is a subset of lion 5B. Um, that's used to make stable diffusion, and it has over 5 billion image text pairs. And these tools can reveal many things. In fact, we'll be publishing multiple investigations shortly. And in it, you'll see why these models have so many problems with race, religion, and gender biases, among many other things. In fact, even OpenAI's own research has underscored this problem, where the GPT model associates maleness with words like large, fantastic, personable, and stable, while words around femaleness include petite, naughty, and pregnant. Words like Islam are strongly associated with terrorism, and these are all of the sorts of stereotypes that are proliferating in training data on which generative AI is built. And it matters when we build models on these kinds of collections. So in short, what are the ways forward here? Well, there's a lot of things we could get into in this panel, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation because we're with some of my favorite scholars who are also working on parts of this problem. But in short, I would say we urgently need more work to understand how AI works. And, and I'm saying this from somebody who works in a very technical lab even the people designing these systems won't be able to tell you exactly how certain answers are being arrived at. We need to think about how to make it more reliable, responsible, and sustainable. But this is not just a technical question. We also need to understand the significant social disruptions that are coming with generative AI. And in particular, to help people understand how these tools can work for them and, of course, where they might fail. For example, we know that chatbots just aren't reliable fact generators, but they are very good at things like text summarization and pattern matching, and limericks, of course. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from what I'm sharing with you today is that generative AI is transformative. It is about to become part of our everyday lives, but it is not magic, and it presents very real technical, social and environmental challenges, which we're gonna to need to recognize and navigate together and at high speed. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure and a little bit of a challenge to follow um, Kate. We've had the chance to talk a lot together on panels. Um, just in case Kate isn't already amazing enough, uh, it, it's maybe important to contact, put the context that she, her flight came in at 5 a.m. last night after being delayed um, many long hours, and she's going on like sleep counted in minutes. Um, it, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to say thanks to Jennifer for inviting me. Uh, being on a panel with two of my really intellectual heroes, it, it put a lot of pressure on me to come up with something profound, and so I decided to talk about my hotel room floor um, this is the floor in the Maxwell Hotel, which some of you who stay, anyone staying in the Maxwell? Ah, this is great. This is so good. You're going to have a lot of context in this talk. Um, it stretches off um, into the distance. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, as, as an artist and a writer, I spent um, the years between 20, uh, 2009 and, and really just a couple of years ago 
um, working, well, still actually working about uh, around the concepts of data and how data are changing the ways we live and exist as human beings. And there's a word that followed me around for a whole decade, and that word was big. I couldn't say that I worked with data without somebody saying, do you mean big data? And I was like, OK. Um, and when my friends, uh, DJ Patil coined this really easy definition of big data at the time, which is like big data is like data that is too big for your laptop. But now we are in, uh, we've traded our, our size-based adjective for large. We have large language models now. We have these large models. Well, what does large really mean? Well, um, if we were to uh, look at, at the entirety of, um, of Lion, which is this data set that, that Kate was talking about before that's quite popular training set, and we were to look at it at this speed, four images changing, one time per second, it would take us 46 years to get through um, the entire set. So we'll speed it up a little bit. Um, this is like a, a whole childhood, um, about six years uh, worth. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep on going um, to try to get us into a context of what are we actually talking about when we're talking about large. You know, large becomes a word which is certainly insufficient when we're dealing with this number, which is 5.85 billion image and text pairs. So, whoa, uh, yeah, see, it's, it, it's so crazy that the, the, um, the screen refused to render it properly. Um, and, and I did the math when I was, when I was coming uh, over here. Uh, next, those of you who live at the, or are staying at the Pineapple Hotel, walk from one end of your hall to the other and look at all of those little squares and then imagine a hotel that was 16,102 stories. And that's how many images are in the Lion training set. Now, this offers a couple of provocations to think about how we consider scale. Right? The first is that these uh, image sets are almost impenetrable to the human gaze. We, we can't know what is inside of them because as we demonstrated, we don't have enough lifetimes to see those images. The, 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 more than any other type of training sets that we've been experiencing over the, the, the last 10 years of, of this machine learning revolution, we've now transcended um, the, uh, the, the ability for us to look at these things. But I think it is still worthwhile for us to look at them. And so one thing we can ask ourselves um, by analyzing the data set is, is where do these images come from? We talk about, about stable diffusion, mid-journey, uh, models like this being, being trained, quote unquote, on, on the whole of the internet. And that's not entirely true. It's trained on a, on a crawl of the internet. There are ways that your content cannot be crawled. Uh, if you have a robots.txt file that says, please don't, uh, please don't scrape my data, then it won't be included in this. But we end up with a fairly large mirror of, of, of the internet. And if, if we do an analysis of what types of images are in the lion set, we get a sense of really where these images are coming from. And actually, each one of these blocks kind of offers us an insight into what type of data is available, but also where did that data come from? And what are the types of permissions involved in getting data from people who were, are the creators of these images? Pinterest, for example, this is by far the largest um, source of images in, in Lion. But we know that Pinterest, by its nature, is a secondhand image posting system. People aren't posting their own images. They're posting other people's images. Often, they're posting images from people who wanted their images protected. And then when somebody else went and posted them on Pinterest, they, be, they somehow become, became unprotected and available to be, for download through these systems. Um, down at the bottom, we have uh, three sites that are, that are quite interesting. SmugMug, which is a photo sharing site, Flickr, we're, we're all aware of. Um, those two. You know, when you when you go through the Lion data set, one thing that becomes quite evident to you is that you know, we, we think of these as, as 5.85 billion images, but there's actually a lot of human lives attached to those. So if you even just look at a few of these images, 
uh, you spend a few minutes scrolling through them, you'll see family pictures, you'll, you'll see lots of pictures of children, you'll see tons and tons of moments from people's private lives who are often posted to these photo sharing sites without a knowledge that they would be shared publicly. You might have done this before. You upload your photos to say Smug Mug and it says, would you like this to be private or would you like to like make it public? And you're like, well, ah, making it public's easier because I, I can send a link to grandma. And so you do that. And now all your family photos are kind of ended up in these systems. And the one that I think is particularly interesting to talk about is the last one. But do people know what DeviantArt is? So Devi DeviantArt is, a, is a, uh, a site for artists to post original artwork. Uh, it's very popular amongst the fan art communities. Uh, and, and, and I should say this, this looks like a small number, 0.5%, but let's remember the total is, is, is uh, 5.85 billion. So this is 30 million images that, that come from DeviantArt. And I, I think about DeviantArt in particular because it's a community of people who, who by and large make money from selling their artwork. So we have this huge block of images that, that are existing um, in, in Lion that really are explicitly from people who, whose, whose livelihood comes from the production of these images. Now, in the introduction to this program, we, we talked about this idea of um, including the people who are stakeholders in these processes. And I think one of the difficult and fundamental challenges that we have moving forward is how do we include these stakeholders in these large um, image models? But then also, how do we consider um, revising and building new types or new versions of these technologies that might it involve um, rather, that, rather than these methodologies of scraping, which is in itself you can kind of understand what, the, what that verb conjures, but more participatory ways of being involved. Um, so that's a lot to think about. It's a, 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 it may be a, a great context for you to be um, some, some ideas to be putting in your mind as you're walking on the, down the hallway on your way to bed uh, tonight. And I'll pass it on to Nathaniel. So I just want to, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. I just want to echo uh, what Kate and Jer said. That's a real honor to be here. And um, for me, uh, this is like my first Comic-Con. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's amazing to be with people who, for me, as the child of an epidemiologist, um, is, uh, uh, you know, your heroes. So it's incredible to be here with you today. Um, here's the headline. I don't think AI is the problem. Um, I think it's a symptom of a broader problem, which is the ethical challenge of group data and that bomb has already gone off. Um, so let's start at the very beginning, like the sound of music. Um, uh, when you're learning to read, ABC, I will not sing the whole song. Um, wh what is data? Can someone give me a definition in five words or less? Try it, it's hard. What's data? Okay, that may actually, not what I was looking for, but um, anybody? No, don't say information. When, all, when, when I do this with my students, they say information, like get the hell out, okay? <laughs> it's the record of a characteristic. In the most simple sense, data is simply the record of a characteristic. And we often think that data is somehow connected to technology and that data is somehow a new thing in human experience. Um, it is very old. And I want us to think about the future and AI by going back into time for a second. Um, data's purpose has always been to make aggregated characteristics legible, okay, in the simplest sense. This is data. This is the OG blockchain. This is from Babylon. Um, it is a receipt for the sale of apples, uh, goats, honey, and sheep. Um, this is data. It is almost 5,000 years old. This is also data. Um, it is the receipt for the sale of a slave girl. We go to the earliest points of antiquity and we hear about data collection 
and the hazards with data collection. This is Herodotus, who wrote about, in Data Dad Joke, the first data points. Um, these are arrowheads um, from the story of the cauldron of Ariantes, who wanted to visualize how big his kingdom was. So he uh, had each man in the kingdom bring an arrowhead to represent one man, only counting men, in the census. And then he melted them into the cauldron of Ariantes. If you did not do this, he would kill you. So it was a bad terms of use on the data exchange. And then he would show the cauldron to other kings to say, hey, look at my big cauldron. I have a big kingdom with lots of men in it. And um, I like to um, really use this example when we talk about future ethical harms um, related to data to show that in the nativity story, it is a story of data harms related to collection, okay? The Christmas story is a data story. So what is this? This is Joseph and Mary going to be registered in Bethlehem. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And because he was of the house and lineage of David, remember that. So how did this data get used? This data was used by Herod to target boys under the age of two in the massacre of the innocents. And he was helped by data experts who the wise men, also back to Babylon, um, the wise men came and they realized that the geofence they built was being weaponized to target these children. And in all the surrounding countryside from two years old and under according to the exact time which he had learned from the wise men. So nothing that we are seeing now on harms is intrinsically a new thing in human history. It is as old as antiquity. So remember that. Um, this is Hans Holrith. Has anyone ever heard of Hans Holrith? He invented what's called the Holrith numbers, which is the beginning of magnetic punch card computing. He entered a contest. I believe it was the 1880-something census. Um, the Census Bureau put out a contest to make it more efficient, and he was obsessed with train ticket fraud on the L in Chicago, and so he invented a punch card system to try to prevent train ticket fraud and built the Holrith computing machines. Um, this is the main computing machine, and this is the sorter. This one is in the Smithsonian. This one is in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. A subsidiary of what is now known as, can anyone guess what the three letters are? IBM. IBM um, called Daymog Computing in Germany was the computing force behind the Reich census. I want you, this is a actual um, prisoner personnel card from Auschwitz. I want you to look at the five numbers. Do you see the five numbers up top? And do you see the biometric data on the side? It's a biometric registration card for people who were gassed because of the Reich census. That's how they were identified so quickly, because they had machine computing behind it, courtesy of IBM. Look at those five numbers. Get ready. That was the basis of the tattoos during the Holocaust were the registration numbers in the Daymog computing system. And this is the scholarship of Edmund Black in his book, IBM and the Holocaust. So when anyone is talking about, oh, there could be a threat from large-scale data collection of populations, this, this was over 80 years ago, guys. OK, this is not new. So data ethics is about as old as the Holocaust, for all intents and purposes. And I want, I'm going to move very quickly here. Think of a, a double helix. In terms of data ethics, data protection, there's two strands. The Brandeisian strand, after Warren Bra uh, Brandeis, the former Supreme Court Justice. We will talk about him briefly in a second. And then Louis Brandeis, sorry. Um, and then the other strand is what I'll call Nuremberg-ian agency. Okay? So Brandeis basically invented in 1890 the right to privacy. 
in his famous work, The Right to Privacy, one of the first Harvard Law Review um, journal articles, he basically said that there is a right to privacy that exists as a penumbra, which means the edge of a shadow within the Constitution. And it is from that that we, in, can anyone tell me when the right to privacy was first recognized by the Supreme Court? This is gonna blow your mind. 1965. In the Griswold decision, which was a contraception decision, by the way, Griswold versus the state of Connecticut, Potter Stewart recognized the right to privacy as necessary for people to have privacy in making decisions about contraception. Wow, really recent, okay? In terms of the Nuremberg lineage saying people have a right to not have their data used in certain ways in research, that comes from the Nuremberg Code and what came from that, including Belmont and the Helsinki Declaration. I won't get into all that, but the point is these things are very new, but they're primarily about personally identifiable information. And they don't think about data from groups specifically, if at all. So why do I think about this? Well, the pathology I study is war. And I use primarily satellites and large data scraping to do it. So I go to some of the most dangerous places on the planet every day, but I do it from space in a computer. Um, this is an arson attack um, in March 2011, um, back to what Jennifer mentioned in South Sudan. And we could see it through imagery. We could see it through heat sensors from, I've got my NASA t-shirt on, through Landsat. We could also see mass graves. These are mass graves. Uh, now I work on Ukraine primarily, and we fuse together satellite imagery and open source data. Is there any PII in this? No. But it is more actionable. You can kill more people with the data I work with than I can if I steal your credit card number or your cell phone. Because what we're doing is DII, demographically identifiable information which is the fuel in the tank of artificial intelligence. We build DII to be able to use AI. What Jer and Kate were talking about is about the creation of large DII sets. And who and how is this DII being collected from? These are Syrians coming out of the water in Lesbos and they're sending a proof of life photo on WhatsApp just one word here on WhatsApp. WhatsApp was the largest app sale in human history in term monetarily, 11 to $16 billion. We don't know the actual number. The, the plurality of active daily users were people without homes running for their lives at the time of that app sale. Bear that in mind. Here's a man who could take two things on the boat, his phone and his child. Here are the uh, Mabatha, um, Buddhist radical monks in Myanmar who were behind the first genocide in 2017 using Facebook to incite and execute that genocide. I'm just going to move through this quickly, but people say this is the information age. No, it's an information age. We have been through multiple information ages and we will go through multiple other information ages. They are usually defined by advancements in storage or advancements in transmission of information or advancements in analytics. What's different about now is those three things, storage, transmission, and analytics, have become fused together. And what are they fused together in? That's a cell phone case with the picture of Guernica on it. And what has happened is that PII protections are no longer enough. We don't have protections for action-based information, mobility data, and we don't have protections or a theory about demographically identifiable information. I will move quickly because I wanna hear from other people other than me, but how do we create DII? We do it by aggregating PII into groups. We do it by deriving it, as you saw in some of the other examples, to create mosaics of combined data. And we do it through Modeling, hey, modeling, by inferring where groups may exist 
in multiple types of data. These three types of group data creation acts are a workflow and they increasingly rely one upon the other and AI is speeding all of this. Didn't create it, it's escalating it. Don DeLillo said the future belongs to crowds. He was wrong. This is Arab Spring, Tahrir Square. The future belongs to those who can predict and dictate what crowds do. We thought we were building the world of tomorrow and we were building Jurassic Park. And I'll skip through this quickly, but open data is a weapon system. And it is being used by people who know how to use it as a weapon system. It has created a social digital terrain. Stop saying cyberspace. That's the 90s in hackers with Angelina Jolie. <laughs> or the net with Sandra Bullock. We are at the collision of sensors, data, and people. Informatics, social systems, and infrastructure have come together, and that's where you model. But it's also where bad guys kill people. Because data is people, and data is power. Act accordingly. One of the things I love about working here at the foundation is that the people that come through this building's door on a daily basis, our guests are some of the most incredible people talking about some of the most important topics out there. And the three of you have given what I think are some of the most important and vital talks that have happened at the foundation in a long time. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give folks in the audience the opportunity to ask uh, questions. Um, there should be a Minty poll here. Let me click on this start Minty. Um, this is an open-ended uh, Minty poll. You can ask any questions that you might want of our panelists. If it's for a specific individual, um, note their name, and I'll make sure to direct it to the right person. But I'll start. We want to go about 10, 15 minutes for this. And I want to ask a question to all of you. Um, and it's about giving me an example of something good or something less good. Um, one of the, the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're dealing with um, systems uh, like the ones that we've discussed this morning, and one of the questions that you know Kate raises in Atlas of AI is you need to be asking yourself, what is being optimized for whom, and importantly, who gets to decide? So I'm wondering if each of you might be able to reflect on a time when either that has worked and you really did have that participatory engagement and you can say that those three questions were answered satisfactorily in the space of a project or on the other hand if you don't have an example of that tell me about where it just did not work and I'll leave it to all of you to just jump in and start chatting. Can I um can I just begin with an amendment? I realized I missed uh, my hotel estimation by an order of magnitude. The hotel, <laughs> the hotel would be 162,500 stories. Ooh. I was going to call you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's a big one. It's within the uncertainty. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to kick us off? I know you've no, seen some no, great. No, I don't. I, <laughs> don't I mean, it's so wonderful being on a panel with, with people whose work I know and, and deeply admire. And I'm actually thinking of some of the examples um, in your work, Chair, with um, indigenous rights communities who've been looking at ways in which you can create permission-based structures yeah. for collecting and using data. This is something that we're now starting to see in the creation of some data sets, which are not about just extracting from people or just harvesting things that people put online and thought it was, you know, to share with their family or, you know, with their graduating year, but ended up, you know, feeding the next AI training data set, but actually looking at giving people permissions. And perhaps the weakest form of permission is an opt-out, the best is an opt-in, but we are starting to see opt-out now being applied to some of the largest training data sets in the world. So we could think about, again, we've talked about Stable Diffusion, which is an image generator, um, has just offered opt-out for artists to say, if you don't want your work used in this way, you can remove it from the training data set. In the first two months, 78 million artworks were removed, and they're predicting that it will be over a billion by year's end. So you're starting to see the creation of something like an awareness 
that data means something to people. And this idea that just putting it on the internet meant that it was fair game for anyone isn't quite enough. So if, if I think about this sort of shift in, in optimizing for whom and who gets a say, there's a new conversation, and, and I'm really excited to see that, that we might start to think about more consensual-based AI modeling. And, and one final example for you is Adobe. So Adobe's created their own AI model called Firefly. I'm sure some of you are aware of it. It's the first model that uses images that they already had a license to or were out of copyright. So again, not affecting sort of the current living generation of artists and creators who might want to use those images in different ways. But I'll pass to you, Jeff. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, we think about moonshot problems and what are the hardest ones. Mm -hmm. And this idea of consent within these data systems is an incredibly hard yeah. question. And it's so hard that people don't like to look at it. Mm. Like it's a very bright light. They don't want to, they don't want to. And I see this actually, I'm an artist and I've been working with data for a long time. And I see this with artists as well who want to engage in projects that use a lot of data. Like the, 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 the challenge around consent is a very difficult one. Um, you, you know, I, I think I think somebody asked like, what makes me optimistic about about data? And, and when I when I came into the building um, this morning, there's a courtyard, the courtyard with these purple flowers, and I was like, what are those purple flowers? And I uh, I took out this app called Seek that I have on my phone, which is uh, run by a, an organization called iNaturalist, and and pointed it at the flower. And it gave me the identification of the flower. And I mean, the name is not going to, it's not stuck to my head, but it's actually a really interesting flower. It was a really important indigenous food source for people of the Pacific Northwest. Um, but, but that whole project, iNaturalist, is kind of built on a fundamentally different um, uh, whole, whole sort of perspective than all the things we've been talking about today, because it's a community project around citizen science that was started with the idea that people would be collecting <laughs> images to to contribute to this effort, and actually, um, if you were to if you were to rank the sort of size of AI projects, there's all the really really big ones um, that are run by companies with billions of dollars. But then right below it is iNaturalist. It's the largest non corporate AI endeavor. It's incredible, and, and its whole process is based not on a data set but on a community. And I find this profound, right? Like, how do we build machine learning not on top of data, but on top of communities? And and it gives us, a, a, you know, I, I go to sleep, and if I want to be hopeful about these things, this is that is that's what I think about. Um, I've had a lot of success operationally with machine vision, um, uh, particularly because I work with a lot of satellite data. Specific example, I'll give two two quickies here, one on the machine data and the other on the consent issue. Um, we ha tried to find a way to better detect arson in sub-Saharan Africa and um, by counting tukuls, which are traditional huts um, uh, that are present all the way from the Horn of Africa down towards uh, DRC. And we found a, we repurposed an algorithm used by NASA to look at craters on Mars and the moon. And we realized that the pixelation at the center of the crater that was identifying was almost identical to the pixelation at the top of a conical tuchel. Mm. <laughs> and so we, we took that algorithm and we basically retrained it from craters to houses. And we used it to create LOJAC for uh, African villages, which is now in some cases used by UN peacekeeping to better detect um, attacks that involve arson, which is commonly what happens. Second thing is I got called in by the UN Relief and Works Agency, which is the UN agency for the Palestinian people to do a data audit with my colleagues. And it turned out, and this, this is allowed to be public, this is not the first time I'm saying it, but it's gonna be shocking, that um, there was uh, not proper consenting being done on sharing of Palestinian health data, particularly uh, data about Palestinian children with congenital genetic illnesses with um, uh, universities that had done an IRB on their side, but there had been no Palestinian IRB. And so um, that was a moment where we were, we were looking at consent forms and we began to piece together, oh, wait a second, oh no. <laughs> and so we called the World Health Organization and said, can you, use, 
can you put together an emergency IRB to come in and shut this down? And so, and we did. And um, they then restarted the research program and they shut down 35 to 40% of the previously approved projects. So what was the key learning there? The key learning there is that it wasn't about technology, it was about audit and about having that audit capacity in place. And we've now developed this flying IRB from World Health Organization that can come in on emergency calls like this where we think we have an, a major, major stop red button ethical issue. One of the questions that I like on here, and I'm trying to figure out how to get this <laughs> to advance between like the multiple Menti platforms so we can see the rest of the questions. But I really like this one a lot, um, where somebody said the technology is clearly on the move. What decisions are left? What decisions can societies and governments still make? You know, has the train left the station and is past the horizon at this point? And when it comes to the decisions that we can make, you know, are there any things that you all see as particularly important um, in, in the coming year? What needs to be solved now? Well, this is extremely timely because, as we know, we had congressional hearings last week um, with Sam Altman, uh, Gary Marcus, mm -hmm. and others uh, testifying on the need for regulation. Uh, Sam Altman, as the CEO of OpenAI, um, calling openly to say, this is urgent, we need rules. I'm excited about these systems, but they can cause serious harm. You're hearing that from the man who is leading one of the smallest, but currently sort of most well-funded teams on the planet to do AI. And they're saying, we can't put the safety rails in place. This has to be done by governments. I think we have to take that at face value. I think we have to listen to that very closely and say, what would that look like? And I'm not going to say this is an easy problem. I actually think regulating AI is going to be extremely difficult. But like any difficult thing, it's something that we need to do collaboratively and across a range of communities. I'm looking at the EU right now. They're about to pass the very first Omnibus AI Act. And the AI Act, while it has strengths and weaknesses, is at least something on the books, they've got something that they can work with. And interestingly, it took four years to draft and it didn't have anything about generative AI. So they very quickly at the end were like, okay, we have to actually create what's called a recital to the act in order to try and contend with this enormous shift that's really just happened in the last six months. So we're seeing a sort of a, a difficulty, a, a lag, if you will, between the ability to say, we can regulate. We've done it before. We did it with nuclear power. We did it with, with pharmaceuticals. Mm. We have the FAA. You know, we can regulate complex systems. I think we've lost confidence. And I think we've, to some degree, been snowed by the story around AI being just, it's just too complicated. It's too yeah. magical. It's enchanted determinism. Don't, don't mess with the, the overlords of AI. We have to. This is a democratic issue. Right. And so that's something we can do. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that, that ability to, under, to, to keep in our mind that this narrative that is being pushed to us by, by these large AI companies is not the only path is a very important one. Right. Uh, and then, you know, really practically, we have, we have a, a very large union in America on strike right now exactly. against AI taking like taking jobs. And, and so there is a labor act in aspect to this that I think is quite important when we talk about sort of creative, creative um, industry. And it really does frame how quickly this is all moving. I mean, most of us probably only found out about GBT less than a year ago. And now we have a major labor union striking against like its use in their industry. And so that offers me anyway some, some ideas in one particular aspect about what could happen. And, and listen to the core thing that Kate is saying. This is not a technological problem, it's a political one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's, that's the headline here. And why we are in this situation is because, uh, you know, to quote the usual suspects, the greatest trick the devil ever played is convincing the world he didn't exist. Um, the greatest trick that tech ever played is convincing the world that somehow regulation of the internet, regulation of tech, technical tools on the internet was somehow um, unnecessary and would reverse technological process. And so we, here's the one sentence. We have been focused on disruption when we should have been focused on absorption. 
not about trying to disrupt systems, but to create absorptive capacity, which includes regulation, to absorb newness into normal. And so we have, for about a decade, and including, I'm not pointing fingers at certain foundations, but um, have been investing in disruptive capacity in very sensitive systems with vulnerable people when we should have been investing in the absorptive capacity to contend with that process of newness becoming normal. And we haven't done it. We've done culturally the opposite. And now we are reaping the consequences of that. And can I just underscore what Nathaniel's just said? This idea of absorption is so important. I think about so many primary school teachers right now in public schools being like, oh, okay, GPT exists and my students are using it and what do I do now? Like, who gave them the training manual of what to do? I'm thinking about public health workers who are like, oh, I have people who are using this to try and get diagnoses on their medical health conditions and they're just inputting all of their health data into these systems, not realizing that it's there's no protection for that data. That data can be on soul. We don't know where it goes. We have a lot of ideas, but we don't know for sure. Where are the ways in which people are being shown how to use these and, and where they might be harmful? We haven't put any work into that absorptive capacity. I love the way you put that. Um, and, and I think that's the piece that's really missing right now. I, 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 yeah, I don't have anything else to say other than I think it's remarkable that there were 64 questions. Uh, yeah, we really nailed that. That's about, I, yeah. I mean, I don't know 69. what 69. Yeah. Yeah. 69 yeah. Yeah. out of. I think that's well more Most than of one of three of you had yeah. a question, which speaks to just how important these discussions are. And I hope you'll have a chance to talk to all of us over the next little while. All of us are like available, easy to find on the internet to get in touch with. And we, we just love to continue these conversations. And thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you all so much. We're going to go to a break now. We'll be reconvening in this room at 11. We'll have a series of uh, interactive workshops. But I want to let folks know the questions that have come in here. Um, our panelists are going to be doing a session with the Foundation's um, AI and LLM Task Force, a closed session later today. I will be bringing many of these questions to that session. They will get addressed there. I think our speakers in the afternoon AI session are likely to touch on many of these topics. And as Jara said, um, the crew, we're going to let Kate have a nap. Um, but <laughs> she will be also around later today and hopefully uh, tomorrow to interact with you, get your questions answered, have these important and critical conversations. So please enjoy your break. Come back at 11 and uh, more AI to come. Thank you all. <laughs>